At this point, I'm so excited to have Hollis Woodard with us today. She is a professor in the University of California at Riverside Department of Entomology and um, has done a lot of really interesting research in her lab, mostly focusing on bumblebees, on social bee evolution, on climate change and their effects on bumblebees, division of labor, early queens, um, some really great uh, research happening there in, um, in her lab in California. We actually met a few years ago at a, a B course, and um, I was so excited to follow Hollis then, her work in um, following Bombus uh, polaris, the Arctic bumblebee, and um, some of the great research that she's doing um, out of her lab. She's also the PI for the US National Native Bee Monitoring Research Coordination Network. I have to look down when I say that because it's so long, but it is this wonderful consortium of researchers across the country who are focusing on native bees, um, helping them pull resources together, collaborate on projects, uh, pull community scientists in, and Hollis and I have done some, some work together to uh, get all of you tied in to that network. How can we Get, provide more, more uh, workshops and skills for community scientists so that they in turn can work with local scientists, can work with researchers across the country to help us conserve and protect these, uh, these wild bees. So I'm, um, I'm really excited to have Hollis here with us. Hollis, I'll go ahead and turn the, um, the screen over to you. Thank you for helping us learn more about uh, threats to bumblebees and some of our opportunities for conservation. Let me unmute myself first. <laughs> How does that look? Looks great. Okay. Hi. Well, this is great. I, Denise, I'm going to try to not look at that participant uh, number <laughs> that has gotten quite high. Uh, I think it's so incredible that you're doing this and that so many people are tuned in to learn about bumblebees. This is so great. Um, I've been hearing good things about these talks. I know some of my favorite bumblebee biologists have spoken before me. Um, some couple are going to speak after me. So um, next week. So uh, Denise, I just think that's it's so great that you've put the work in to do this and educate people. So kudos to you. Um, I'm going to try to tackle the very um, complex and interconnected topic of bumblebee conservation. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the threats to bumblebees, uh, but I'm also going to intentionally talk about some of the opportunities that we have. By we, I mean we in the broad sense, everyone from scientists, um, researchers, everyone. There are things that we can do and I wanna, I'm gonna start on a little bit of a heavy note, um, but I promise by the end of the talk, I'm gonna give some, a little bit of optimism that I think is, is warranted, so. But first, who am I? Uh, I have a research lab, as Denise mentioned, uh, at the University of California Riverside in the entomology department. We are a bumblebee lab, so I guess our tagline is all bumblebees all the time. <laughs> we work a lot on nutrition and social biology, so I'm going to weave in a few things we know about those topics um, into this talk, and I'm going to also talk about some things that I'm guessing you've already heard about from, for example, Jamie Strange, who's really an expert in bumblebee um, pathogens and health. So I'm I am gonna touch on that, but I'm gonna talk quite a bit about nutrition and a little bit about social biology. And one of the topics that my lab is extremely focused on um, is the, the queen cast. So bumblebee queens, they face some special challenges that, uh, Y'all in the room have already heard, uh, you know, about queens and some of the things that they go through. Um, but in terms of research on bumblebee queens, they are still an understudied cast. Part of the reason why is it's more challenging to work with them in some ways than whole colonies. So, but I'm going to talk about some of the some of those things that they have to face um, and some of the opportunities for doing research with them and and for advancing conservation. And uh, on the right, this is Rafi, uh, one of our youngest lab members, holding up a, a queen uh, Bombus bazinskii that she did not catch, but she did safely handle it <laughs> in a vial afterwards. Um, I'm going to start um, on a bit of a, a dark note, um, and this is this idea that we are living in an age of mass extinction. So we call this the Anthropocene. Um, this is an era, it's our modern era, and the, the rate of species loss uh, is greater than we've seen in recorded human history. So um, 
this loss is tied to the ways we've transformed uh, the planet. So um, I, I just wanna start with this kind of baseline statement that this Anthropocene is happening. And uh, bumblebees, like many other organisms, are being heavily impacted. So I'm gonna put some numbers on that and talk a little bit more about what we know about bumblebee decline. Um, but I, I just wanna make the point that to me, um, this insect biodiversity loss, or not just insects, um, biodiversity loss in general, it's really not a mystery. You, you can't transform the world the way that we have done, especially in the last 50 to 100 years, without there being some serious consequences. So, you know, here in the US, for example, you have 1% of certain prairie types left. Um, these prairies used to be prime habitat for bumblebees. Uh, now they have to find food resources in the margins of crop fields where pesticides are um, not remaining exactly where we put them. Uh, you know, we've, we've changed things. And to me, it's almost a bit more of a surprise why some of our bumblebees seem to be doing great and even thriving in spite of how we've changed things. So I know that's a kind of heavy, but it's, it's worth sort of starting off with that. To me, it's realistic. So it's not, um, uh, it's not, it's alarming, but not alarming. So this is my starting point. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the evidence for decline. What do we know about bumblebee decline and a little bit about how we know it. Uh, I'm going to talk about the drivers of decline. So um, some of the key culprits and I'm going to focus really heavily on how they interact with one another because I think that's a really important um, point to make. I'm going to talk about the importance of life history. Life history just means the different life stages or processes that happen across the life of an organism and it connects those two population dynamics. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about bumblebee life history. I'm guessing y'all are already um, experts in this area by now, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how some of these life stages and processes might be particularly sensitive. So they're important focal areas for research to advance bumblebee conservation, which Partly this is because this is what I work on and I really wanted to incorporate it into the talk and I think it is important. Uh, and then I'm gonna close with some opportunities for conservation um, for everyone. So starting off though, a little bit about um, the evidence for bumblebee decline. I wanna start this by saying decline can be difficult to assess. This is something I'm learning more and more as I'm leading this national native bee monitoring effort that Denise mentioned. Um, it's hard to say that something is declining sometimes. So uh, there are species that exist at low population sizes. They always have maybe, um, they're just rare. And so if you have difficulty collecting data on these species, it's hard to see that there have been changes through time. So um, there are some bumblebees that fit this kind of criteria. As far as we know, to the best of our knowledge, they've always been rare. And so those species are really hard to track or monitor. There are bees in understudied places. So shout out to Alaska. I noticed a bunch of folks from Anchorage and I saw, I think I saw Fairbanks and some other cities. Um, on the right, this is a bumblebee, um, Bombus polaris, uh, the polar bumblebee. Uh, Alaska has really mobilized in the last, especially in the last year, but really the last few years in terms of trying to collect more data on bees and other pollinators. So they're actually, you know, they get a gold star for all the work that the folks in Alaska have been doing to try to monitor um, native bees. But part of the reason why they're mobilizing so much is that we are lacking a lot of data on bee distributions um, and abundance. Um, from Alaska. And so um, if a bee happens to live in an understudied place, we usually just know less about it because fewer people are collecting data. There's some taxonomic confusion. So there are what's called cryptic species. These are species that if you look at one and even I look at some of these and we think, oh, these two bees are the same species. If you dig a little deeper, maybe use molecular methods or use certain characters, they're actually two different species. So sometimes it's really hard to tell. And some of that confusion can influence how much we think certain species are declining. So I have on the bottom left, a little photo of Bombus collagenosis. This is a bumblebee that looks really similar to Bombus bozzezinskii here in California. So boz, as we call it affectionately, is the most common and relatively abundant bumblebee in California in nearly every place. That's, there are always a little few asterisks in biology, so there are a couple exceptions, but in general, it's a very common bee. Collagen is a species that's on our, it's a species of special concern for our state. And so it 
we think it's declining. But you have a situation where people are overwhelmingly ascribing a bee that they find that looks like this, I think, to Vazazinskii because they look so similar. Vaz is common. And so, you know, it's so collagenosis might be less rare than we think. It might be more rare. So this taxonomic confusion and trying to address it and understand it is critical for um, conservation because you need to know what you're looking at and what species it is in order to assess whether something's declining and to assign conservation sort of action to something. Um, bees in general too have really high interannual variation in their population sizes, interannual meaning between years. Some bumblebee species, um, some years you see them everywhere, some years you hardly spot them and you can be looking just as hard each year and they just vary in their population sizes through time. And so if you don't collect enough data across enough years, you might think, oh, wow, you know, Bombus polaris populations really tanked this year, but in reality, th this might be just a natural cycle that um, doesn't really reflect decline. Um, or maybe their species are declining and we're not um, catching that because we're assuming there's interannual variation. So it goes both ways and you really need to try to study these processes and figure them out in order to, to take conservation action. And then this, uh, this seems like I'm being flippant, but I really mean it, bees are small and they can be difficult to spot. So um, Bombus franklini is a bumblebee that just ended up on our federal endangered species list. I think Franklin is still out there. It's just, it's, it's uh, rare. And it's actually, there's a little bit of taxonomic confusion there too, because it's a little difficult to distinguish from some other species that live in the same place. And it's just small. So it's, you know, it's hard to find. And so um, bees being as small as they are makes them difficult to detect sometimes. And so for all these reasons, I just want to make the point that we might be underestimating the number of species are, that are declining. We might be overestimating decline for some species. Nonetheless, uh, the pattern overall is clear that bumblebees um, are in trouble. Uh, just to make this point a little bit more clearly, I mentioned this bumblebee, Bombus bazazenskii, that is super common in California. If I see a bumblebee in Riverside, for example, well, we see a few species here, but usually I see this species vase. So what you're looking at here, well, there's a photo of the species over on the left. Now I'm showing you two maps of California. Um, and this is um, modeling to try to understand the availability of habitat for the species. And essentially what you do is you take all the records of this bee and you look at where it was found and what habitat type it was found in. And then you extrapolate from that information to try to predict what where its habitat might be. So if you you take the records prior to 2000 and you do that process and you look, you know, you can see in the foothills of the Sierras, pretty far east in Southern California, throughout Northern California, it looks like, oh, this is great habitat. So here's a bee that I've just told you is relative to other species. It's really common and abundant. But if you look at, at records after the year 2000 and you do that same process where you try to extrapolate and understand where you might find it, if you look at the two images, oh, and dark green means good. <laughs> so green is good. Dark green is good habitat. Lighter is not is less suitable. Um, so if you look at this, there are a bunch of places here in California where you're you're way less likely to find this bee. And so even though we might consider it a winner here in California, um, it is in a sense it's a it's not doing great in terms of its habitat availability. And if you model this out into the future, it starts to look really alarming. So I just want to make that point too that. Um, everything is kind of relative and things can be declining, you know, as a species. Uh, but if you compare that to other species, it might look like they're doing fine. So these are some really important points that influence how we interpret the data that we collect. Some species, though, are really obviously not doing well. So Bombus affinis is a bit of a poster child for this, unfortunately. Um, so here I'm showing you um, some older records are in red and some more recent records are from the year 2000 on. There's something about the year 2000. There are a lot of bumblebee um, uh, bumblebee species that around that time people started to at least notice their decline. Um, declines were probably happening far before that time. And in fact, we know that for some species. I just want to make the point that that is there was a, a sort of a reckoning around that time in terms of bumblebee um, statuses and decline. So here's a species of Aphanis that um, is you know, clearly was doing really well. And then it, it really tanked and you, you find it in some remnant places. And there are actually some new records now because of some of the efforts of community scientists such as yourselves, maybe even yourselves if you're in the room. So um, there is some, some good news here with Aphanis. And now that it's on our federal endangered species list, 
um, it will receive more protections or it is receiving already. And so, um, but unfortunately, this is an example of a species where the pattern is really clear and we don't know entirely why. Um, but like I mentioned at the start of my talk, for me uh, personally, as a bumblebee researcher, um, I'm honestly surprised that we don't see more patterns like we see for Aphanus. For me, the mystery is not why Aphanus declined. It's how other species have continued to persist in these same areas. So that's a personal opinion based on the science. I want to say this too. So I, I mentioned I've been using the word decline a lot, but there are lots of other types of changes that are human mediated, probably or likely, um, that influence bumblebee persistence. So what I'm showing you here are, again, this is splitting historical and modern uh, records of bumblebees. Um, so in the green is historic and in the yellow is modern. You kind of have to flip the graph a little in your mind to look at it. So this is showing you the relative abundance of different bumblebee species, which gives you a sense of the, the community of bumblebees um, at certain time points. And one thing that's happened here in Vermont, this is from the Vermont um, Bumblebee Atlas um, project. This is one of the, the products of that. Um, but there we see this in other places too, is that the relative abundance of species is changing. And so this has huge ramifications for uh, pollination of all kinds of plants and the persistence of ecosystems and processes like disease spread among bumblebees. And so this is not um, some of these species are declining, but this is another way to understand how changes in, in sort of species, uh, groups of species can be meaningful and we can extract some, some meaningful information from that as well. A uh, couple points about bumblebee decline. So we think that more than a third of bumblebee species are declining. Um, I will say there are a lot of bumblebees that we just don't have enough data to do um, assessments for. And so there are a lot that are called data deficient that we just can't do uh, a reasonable assessment with. But if we look at the species that we do seem to have enough data for, a couple of patterns emerge. One is that this pattern that um, quite a few bumblebee species are declining. Declining. If we look at the phylogenetic distribution of these species, that just means phylogenetic, meaning the family tree. If we look across um, the, the re evolutionary relationships of bumblebees, we see that there are a couple of subfamilies, which are listed over on the left, that are, looks like being hit harder. And there are aspects of their biology that I can tell you we don't fully understand yet, although there are some, some insights that might help explain um, why they're declining in particular. Theracobombus is one example, and I've uh, the little list of species up on the top right um, are the species within this, um, within this uh, subgenus. Another way to think about decline and kind of predict decline is that there is a lineage of bumblebees, um, well, actually two lineages of bumblebees that are social parasites. These are bumblebees that parasitize other bumblebees, which is so interesting. This species on the left, this is um, Bombus campestris. This is not a species um, uh, around here, but I just wanted to show you, it's gr a great photo that kind of gives you a look at, at what these species tend to look like. Um, they tend to have a elongated um, abdomen and um, have a little bit, it's hard to explain, but you can you know it when you see it, these, um, these some of these cuckoo species. And they, I'm gonna go into detail about the bumblebee life cycle um, in a few more slides, but. Uh, I recommend checking out this um, this uh, uh, paper that I pulled this figure from by Lahome and Hines from 2018. It's all about these cuckoo bumblebees. And essentially what happens is, and no, I don't know if my pointer works, so I'm just gonna say it. Essentially what happens is the, the, the host bumblebees, they start carrying on with their life cycle. These social parasites emerge a little bit later um, or around the same time, and they then invade the nest of their host. And just like we've seen in many other systems, if you have a host parasite situation and the host starts to decline, the parasite either needs to shift to another host. And some of these bumblebee species we think can do that, or we know can do that, but you better be able to, otherwise you're going to be declining too. So you, your fate is in some ways inextricably linked to the fate of another. And we see that we see quite a few of these cuckoo bumblebee species um, declining. So I'm going to get a little bit into the drivers of decline. Um, there are many. They interact with one another, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. Um, poor nutrition, uh, exposure to insecticides, pathogens, diseases, fungicides too aren't as well studied, but they also play a role. Climate change kind of 
swoops in and, and influences nearly all of these things that sort of the patterns of how, how we change our landscapes, which changes these stressors. So they are exposed to many different stressors. One of the stressors, and this is something I work on uh, myself is nutrition. So um, bumblebees feed on pollen and nectar. Um, they you can see this bumblebee on the top left. She's got those giant pollen loads on her legs. She's collecting those and is gonna bring them back to the nest. It's like, she's put it in her little storage case. Um, and the bumblebee on the top right is nectaring on a flower. Uh, as they're out foraging, um, bumblebees will consume some of the poll pollen and quite a bit of the nectar. But overwhelmingly, in terms of like the mass of what they're collecting, it's going back to the nest. And uh, it is being either stored short term or it's being fed to developing larvae. I work on larval feeding and development, and I think it's so interesting and you can't really, well, you can't see it happening unless you have access to a nest. So I'm going to show you a little video of this later if I have time, but these nutrients that are coming from pollen and nectar, they're being directly fed to the larvae in a really interesting um, social interaction. And those nutrients coming from pollen and nectar are helping those larvae to grow and develop. Um, so nutrients are kind of flowing from plants in the form of pollen and nectar. Um, they are being consumed in part by the adults that are collecting them or visiting the flowers. And then a lot of it is being brought back to the nest um, for developing brood. Um, we can split things out, um, not imperfectly, but we can say that most of the sugars that come mostly from nectar are used for flight energy. If y'all haven't read Bern Heinrich's work, I highly recommend it. Um, and I can type some of the names of his books um, in the chat when I'm done, but I, there are, there's a lot of great work on how bumblebees use um, sugar for energy and how it fuels processes like flight is one of the particularly energetically demanding activities that they do that requires a lot of sugar. Um, they are also using sugar for growth and development as well. They're just using most of it for flight. Um, they're also consuming um, or acquiring protein and lipid from primarily pollen and they're using that primarily in terms of most of the mass of it is going to early development. That's not the only um, purpose of, of protein and lipid for bumblebees, but just in terms of the most of it is going to that purpose. Um, bumblebee queens, I'm gonna talk a little bit about their overwintering life stage. Um, they store sugar in the form of glycogen and they store lipids. Uh, and they consume uh, pollen and nectar before they go into overwintering and they go into a diapause or hibernation state and they uh, metabolize those stored nutrients during overwintering. Um, micronutrients are really important for bumblebees. I can just tell you, we know a lot less about this um, and we know even less about secondary compounds that aren't nutritional per se, but they are compounds that are found in pollen and nectar that have been shown to have some um, protective and some harmful um, consequences for bumblebees when they consume them. I just wanna make the point that the nutrition in bees, just like humans, is incredibly complex. Um, when it comes to micronutrients, secondary compounds, there are so many, there's so much we don't understand. Um, and these, the nature of uh, bumblebee nutrition is multifaceted, different things interact with other things. It's very difficult to manipulate in a precise way bumblebee nutrition in the lab. So I'll just kind of close by this by saying that there's a lot that we still don't know, although there's some really interesting and promising things as well. So bumblebees um, benefit the most when they have access to lots of different uh, floral resources. The reason being the pollen and nectar from different plants can have really different compositions nutritionally. And so um, it's a bit of bet hedging. If you have lots of different options to choose from and bumblebees can visit lots of things, they're more likely to have the complete suite of nutrients in their diet. It's just like us, you know, we wouldn't be healthy if we only ate carrots. Um, you know, we get beta carotene and that's great, but we need lots of other things too. So bumblebees need a diverse diet too. Um, and I'm gonna touch on that a little bit more. Um, when it comes to pesticides, um, I wanna just make a few kind of key takeaways with this. Um, pesticides can have very direct clear effects so they can cause mass die-offs. I'm, I'm sure y'all have maybe heard about um, the linden trees that were sprayed in Oregon. The story is a little more complicated than just being due to parasite, um, pa uh, pesticides potentially, um, but um, there are many cases where um, Pesticides have been directly applied during bloom periods and there have been mass 
deaths uh, for bee, bumblebees and other types of bees. Um, but there's the spectrum of this kind of mass death on one end of the spectrum. And then there is a whole suite of sublethal effects. These are effects that are not lethal, but they're um, having a, a harmful effect nonetheless. And I'm showing you uh, a figure that I pulled from one study um, where uh, the exposure to a neonicotinoid um, pesticide changes whether bumblebees forage during the night and day, night and day, it changes their activity during these two periods differently. Um, and so bumblebees don't forage at night. There are actually some species in the Arctic that um, do, <laughs> but in general, bumblebees don't forage in the dark. Um, and so changing their activity patterns at night, um, this might seem just like a quirky, weird um, response of the pesticide, but there are many studies now that have taken these kinds of sublethal effects that influence one aspect of foraging or activity or behavior, and they kind of play it out to its consequences, and they find that this ultimately affects the ability of colonies to survive, produce queens, et cetera. And so I'm doing a bit of work on these sublethal effects, and I think that area of research is really um, interesting to work in. I think there's a lot um, we can do there because I think um, sometimes you run an experiment and you might not see an effect on mortality or queen production, but if you can show that there's a molecular consequence of a pesticide, it might give you uh, it gives you some hints that um, if you play this out in real world landscapes, those consequences might be greater than you see in a sort of controlled study. And so I think that area of work is really exciting. Um, neonicotinoid insecticides, this is one class that is one of the big baddies when it comes to um, bees. Um, we have here in the US and elsewhere in the world, have, there's been this massive increase in the use of these pesticides. They are, you know, applied to seed seed um, coatings. They're also sprayed in some cases, um, but they don't stay where they're put, like so many toxicants, and they leach into the soil. They're taken up by the plants, including by the pollen and nectar. They act on the bee nervous system, and so they have, uh, you know, at high enough concentrations, they cause lethal effects. But they have a ton of sublethal effects that have been studied pretty extensively. Um, and so, uh, and then one of the worst consequences I would say of them is that they ultimately affect colony development and specifically queen production. So if a bumblebee, I'm going to, again, I'm going to show the life cycle in a minute and I can kind of reference this back, but um, if a bumblebee queen can't start a nest, produce some workers to help her, uh, ultimately produce new males and new queens, then her lineage will not persist. So, and in theory, the more queens, the better. And so if you look at queen production as a response to pesticide exposure and you see that, that the exposure ultimately affects that as a response, that's not good. <laughs> that's a clear effect on fitness. Uh, mortality is the same, but queen production is another sort of sublethal consequence that, um, it, but it, very, it really speaks to the um, harmful consequences of the pesticide on population dynamics. Um, there are pathogens, parasites, viruses too. Here's just a a smattering of some of the worst ones. So Perthidia bombi. Um, again, I know that y'all heard Jamie Strange speak um, and he is really an authority on bumblebee pathogens. And so I'm sure he went into some of this himself, but just to give a little overview of some, some of these. So there's Perthidia, lives in the digestive tract, spread through feces. One of the consequences is that it impacts ovarian development. If a bumblebee queen is infected with this and can't develop her ovaries, she can't produce eggs. If she can't produce eggs, she can't produce workers, males, or new queens. And so it has this effect on their reproductive um, ability. Apocystis is less well studied, although there are quite a few studies now, um, lives in the digestive tract in the fat cells, increases mortality. Nosema, same thing, increases mortality, lives in the digestive tract. Spirillaria is a little different. It's a nematode. Um, if you've ever found a bumblebee and dissected it and seen these kind of spill out. It's quite an experience. Um, Cerularia can be found within the body cavity. Um, and it's when bumblebee queens come in contact with soil, which they do when they overwinter, um, they can be infected with this nematode. And it's referred to as a castrating nematode because it also has these effects on reproductive capacity. And so these are some of the baddies and some of these have been linked to bumblebee decline. Um, even if they haven't, I would argue that spreading them is not good <laughs> and has effects on individual bumblebees, 
the, the health and success and survival of a single colony and could ultimately influence um, persistence of species. So all of these are bad. I, I don't have this on the slide, but I just want to make the point too that there are um, viruses as well. They're harder to study. You know, um, any of these with a good enough microscope or even with the naked eye for some of them, you can dissect the bee and you can see it. But viruses you can't see with the naked eye or with the microscope. And so um, you have to use molecular detection to do that. And in fact, there are viruses that could be being spread today that we, we don't even know about them yet. It's just like with humans. So, um, you know, virus um, research in bumblebees is really important. And I think it's kind of a hidden um, hidden piece of bumblebee decline. It's not that people aren't thinking about it. It's not that they're not working on it, but I just mean, I think it might play an even bigger role than we realize simply because of a, again, this is a detection issue. I'm um, kind of like I talked about with species persistence and decline. Um, I want to talk a bit more about bumblebees and climate change. Um, bumblebees, we think, evolved in the area of the Tibetan Plateau. So they evolved in a cool place. Um, and today you find most bumblebee species in cooler places. So this is work done by Paul Williams, um, looking at the number of species found in different places. So you can see when you start getting to South America, there are quite a few fewer species, except for if you look in the Andes, you'll see a little ribbon of, of more um, diversity. Um, one of the reasons why we think they evolved in the Tibetan Plateau is because species diversity is the highest there. So there's this idea that um, in the place where species originate, you tend to have the most um, species in that region, which is kind of a fun thing to think about. But bumblebees have obviously, they've spread to all kinds of places. We've moved a few species to some new places. So, um, you know, but in general, you tend to find them in, in cooler places. And it's this aspect of their evolutionary history that has some influence on their persistence today. Here's a figure I pulled from a study that came out um, just this year. It's really neat. Um, this research crew studied, tested bumblebees around the world, and they looked at species that live in more Mediterranean hot climates or in polar climates and everything in between. And what they found is, and it's a little hard to read, I realize that, but on the y-axis, it's, it's time before heat stupor. So it's a test that you can do where you subject a bee to intense heat and you look at how long it takes for the bee to let's just say, not be able to withstand that heat. And so it's a bit unsurprising, I think, but it's great to test this, that the species that have to live, that live in places that are hotter have a higher tolerance for heat than um, species in polar areas. This is a perfect example of a study where someone did some research with bees, um, captured them, subjected them to an assay, and now we have this information in addition to this pattern, um, sorry, light just went out in my, in my office. In addition to this pattern, we also can see, uh, or we also have concrete numbers now for what the tolerance of individual species is. And so we can use this information that some bumblebee scientists went out and collected. Um, and now we can try to model how distributions of bumblebees will change with continued climate change. So I think this is really important. But so that was an example of a um, or relates more to the, this idea that temperature has direct effects on mortality. There is some temperature at which a bumblebee just can no longer, individual bumblebee can no longer exist. Um, but it has, climate has all sorts of other types of changes. So it can change the foraging window for bumblebees if it's too hot. I can tell you for sure here in Southern California, they will not fly. Um, so you're shifting when bumblebees can fly when, when it gets warmer. There's winter activity. Queens will actually come out of overwintering if it's warm enough. Um, that's not a good thing, generally speaking, um, because they've evolved to stay in an overwintering state and slow their metabolism. If it warms and they come out of that and then it gets cold again, they burn through some of their energy stores more quickly than they might have otherwise. Um, there are tons of indirect negative effects of climate change on habitat quality. There's, I can keep going on. There's erratic weather and food availability. Um, I went to Alaska and was out um, in, in near one of the field stations there and there's beautiful tundra, flowers everywhere. I just got up in the morning, couldn't wait to go find some bumblebees and didn't see a single bumblebee. And what had happened was, I guess, is it had warmed, flowers had bloomed, bumblebees had come out a few weeks before I arrived. And then it, weather changed, started snowing again, snow blanketed the landscape, and now there's no food. And so the bumblebees, especially at that early stage of nest development, they only have so much food source. So if they can't get out and forage and collect more, well, that's the end of their nest. So the queens have to potentially 
start a nest again, or the queens can't even survive if they run out of food. So um, erratic weather is one of the other consequences. There's some great work now that shows that pollen and nectar availability or abundance is influenced by um, drought and other aspects of climate change. There's some evidence, just to put a positive note, that bumblebees can change where they live. They can shift to higher elevations, but of course there are limits to where you can go. Um, and so there's that plasticity or that resilience, there's a limit to that, um, that, that bears mentioning. I showed you this figure before. I'll, I'll just say in the interest of time, this was, I put this here to illustrate that I think part of what's going on for this species, Bazazensky eye in California, has to do with climate change and drought. Here in California, well, everywhere is being impacted by climate change, but here we're kind of on the front lines of it because it's warming and drying faster in the southwestern U.S. than elsewhere. And I think this bee and all the other bumblebees in California are being severely impacted um, by climate change. It's a hard thing to, to test because climate change is such a multifaceted thing, um, but we do have some evidence that that this is part of the part of the issue. And I certainly think that this is part of the issue because I can tell you here in Southern California in the spring, you see bumblebees, you see awesome food availability, and then it gets too hot and dry and it all dries up. So those bumblebees either have to be, they have to finish their colony cycle and the queens have to be overwintering already, or they're just not gonna persist. So um, that's a little bit of info about that. Um, Stressors interact. This is important. Uh, and this is a big area of research now when it comes to pesticide effects on bumblebees. There are all these interconnected interactions. So when you, for example, on the left of this figure, if you reduce uh, wildflower availability because you're growing crops more intentionally or intensively, you are uh, removing food resources um, for bees. You're having uh, more bees are going to those patches. They're interacting more with one another. Um, if you have uh, beekeepers moving honeybees into new places, for example, bumblebees can, uh, excuse me, honeybees can spread disease to bumblebees. This can lead to interactions. And then you have rather than exposure a single pesticide, what you tend to have is a cocktail of things, pesticides, fungicides, other compounds, heavy metals in our agricultural ecosystem. So bumblebees, you know, a lot of the research looks at a single pesticide or maybe another pesticide with it and the interactions, but in reality, it's a cocktail that they're being exposed to. And so this is some of the, the ways that bees, as they're out in landscapes, they're experiencing lots of different things. So if you're a bee and you leave your, let's say you're a bumblebee, um, and you leave your nest and you're a central place forager. So you're going out and flying different places of the landscape. You're flying probably across a patchwork of different habitat types and, and you're experiencing lots of different stressors depending on what's around your nest. So if you are, for example, um, say you fly to a monocultural crop system, a big field of canola, your pesticide exposure is almost certainly very high. You have a lot of food, but as I mentioned earlier, diversity is really important too. And so that's your situation there. If you fly to a wildflower meadow, um, pesticide exposure may be lower. Although I also mentioned that these pesticides are not staying where we put them. Um, nothing does really. And so even in wildflower meadows, they're being exposed to um, quite a bit of um, pesticides. Um, so your exposure may be low, um, but um, what flowers tend to be less abundant, but you will get that diversity. Um, and then I just put a little disagree thing that in non-flowering crops, um, pesticide exposure probably isn't low because we're probably, we use a lot of pesticides. You might not, growers might not be targeting bees with those pesticides. In fact, they're not targeting bees. Um, they're targeting some kind of insect, but those those um, pesticides are, are actually impacting bees as well if they happen to visit these areas. Um, so. These are the landscapes that our bees are having to deal with. I'm gonna skip over this slide. I just wanna mention that you have to think about this at different scales too, like the, the exposure of stressors. I work on that bottom little scale, the, the idea that um, stressors affect metabolism, physiology, reproduction. That's the kind of stuff I work on. So really the individual level and below, but all these effects scale up and, and impact bees at, at, and ecosystems at these all these different levels. So I recommend this paper for kind of thinking about this multi-scaled um, situation. And then I'll just mention pesticides can, in, can interact 
well, stressors can interact synergistically or additively or in other ways. Synergy is, you know, you're greater than the sum of your parts. So um, some pesticides, you put them together, each one has a harmful effect on a bumblebee. You put them together and they can have an effect together than you might've predicted by the effect of each on its own. Or they can be additive, which is basically you're, you're summing those negative effects together. There's also some evidence that, um, for ameliorative effects or buffering effects. So we've done some research in my lab, for example, that exposed bumblebee queens to a pesticide and then fed them different diets. And what we see is that when we look at changes in the brain, um, so certain pesticide diets can completely remove the effect of the pesticide on the brain. So there are some ways that managing foraging habitat, for example, can ameliorate the effects of the pesticide. I pulled this figure from this study by Klein et al. because I think it's really it, it really kind of um, showcases why different stressors interact with each other. Um, so what they did in the study was they thought about what we know about the effects of individual stressors on different parts of the brain and ultimately um, how they affect bee um, cognition and behavior and foraging. And um, this is a perfect example of a, organisms are not closed systems. All the pieces interact. Part so the brain interact with one another, they send signals to the rest of the body. Uh, when these different stressors act on different parts of the brain, the response of that is sort of, is integrated by the nervous system. And so this is, this is just a great example of why um, stressors interact with one another and how understanding why that's the case in many ways requires looking inside of the organism to try to understand it. I'm going to get to talk a little bit about my favorite thing, which is life history. Again, these are the life stages of the processes that happen um, for organisms. Here's the bumblebee life cycle. I'm gonna guess you've heard about this before, but in spring, many of you mentioned in the chat when we signed on that um, spring queens are starting to come out, which is amazing. They've been out here in California for a little, well, in Southern California for a little bit now. Queens have to start nests on their own. Um, so that's up in the top right-hand corner. They produce colonies, these colonies grow in size, produce more and more workers. Ultimately, they switch to male and new queen production. And then over on the top left, that's an overwintering um, bumblebee queen. So in during winter or the time of year where you are, where there aren't bumblebees, um, whether or not that's a sort of a real winter, um, the queens are on their own. They're the only cast that exists at that point in the life cycle and at that point in the year. So um, when queens overwinter, they are underground um, for the most part, and they are protected. I love this little photo of a bumblebee queen in a flower pot. Um, they need to, by they I mean queens, need to store enough fat and sugar in the late summer and, or fall before they go into overwintering if they can't want to survive. So my lab has done a little bit of work on this idea that they have to have certain nutrients in order to make it through overwintering. Queen mortality is likely very high at this stage, but to be honest, we don't have really good data on that because it's really hard to find overwintering bumblebee queens. So there's a, again, it's this lack of detection, lack of information issue that's keeping us from being able to make strong statements about this. But nonetheless, there's um, compelling evidence and it sure makes sense that bumblebee queens um, at this time, they're on their own. Um, they don't have any social group members to help them do anything. And if they don't get the food resources, um, we know from laboratory research, they won't make it through the winter. As I mentioned earlier, the winter active bumblebees, warmer temperatures can cause queens to come out of overwintering as well. This is a stage I work really heavily on in my lab. I'm so interested in how bumblebee queens do this. So when they come out of overwintering, they are single moms for a few weeks. They are the only bumblebees in their nest. It's just them. And so they come out and they look for nest sites. They lay eggs, which you can see over on the top right. Um, and then they have to rear this first brood of offspring. And it is only when that first brood, it closes as adults, that they transition to being a social, uh, a youth social group where the queens have helpers. And so, um, but up until that point, queens have to do everything on their own. That means foraging for the nest, um, tending to the brood. They have to leave their brood unattended. There's no one else, no other adults to help defend them or anything. So, and then they have to do all the nest construction, which includes produ production of wax and any sort of fussing with or tending to the nest. So, and then all of this is happening. This kind of interfaces with this idea that it's all happening in spring, a time when food resources tend to be less predictable and weather patterns, uh, our food availability is less predictable and weather patterns can change. As I mentioned about my little vignette about being up in the Alaskan tundra, um, you know, so queens are having to do all this work on their own. Um, and many nests at this stage likely failed too. We have uh, 
a, a bit more laboratory research that tells us this, and we're doing some work now to try to show in the field um, that this happens as well. But it's another one of those stages. It's really hard to find a bumblebee nest. Well, it's real hard to find one at the beginning of the season when it's just a queen and maybe her first little cohort of workers. I wanna show you what brood care looks like in bumblebees if I can get this video to play. Let's see, ah, might not play. Um, yeah, I will, I'm gonna share these slides with folks and, um, or I can link uh, you to this video, but um, when bumblebees are caring for their brood, um, and this is a queen, it's, we use these little kind of night vision security cameras to watch bumblebees in their nest. Um, here's a queen on some brood and she has to sit on them and incubate them. Um, I have a photo of that too. She has to directly feed them. And there's this little behavior they do that's the regurgitating for their larvae that I think is so cute. And we work a bunch on that. Um, in my lab. Um, the uh, queens, as I mentioned, they also have to forage. Um, this is some work by Erica Serra, uh, almost PhD from my lab, who's defending next week, and a bioengineer, Will Grover. They designed this little system where you can put these little tags on the back of bumblebees and Erica put these on queens out at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. Um, so on the left, here's the queen with a little, one of these little RFID tags on her. In the middle, this is an actual nest and you can see the little honey pot and the little brood clump. And over on the right, you can see kind of the, the tech. This is the system that includes a reader. So the queens can come and go and forage. These are wild queens that have just started nests. And then Erica can go and pull the data and she can see the pace of foraging. And here's one figure from one queen I'm showing you on the bottom. This is um, time when she was in the nest in purple and time she was out foraging. So you can see these ladies are busy. I mean, they are constantly coming and going from the nest. I mentioned that brood have to be incubated back home. They have to be fed. There's no one else to do the work at this stage. So the queens are kind of coming and going in and out of the nest uh, in order to do all the work. And so it seems tiring. <laughs> and you can imagine that if food resources are scarce at this time when she's doing all this flight activity, um, or if she's having to look really hard for food resources, that these can be this can play out and be really harmful for early nesting success. They also incubate, as I mentioned, here's a thermal image. This is a little bumblebee um, within the square. Um, so bumblebees warm themselves and they transfer that heat to their brood sometimes. Um, and we can study this behavior, but this, this takes energy um, to warm yourself. And so if they're nectar limited, there's some evidence that they're not able to, to do this sort of warming behavior as much. So. Queens, again, just to make this point really, I feel really strongly about this. They're having to do all these different energetically demanding and time demanding tasks. They have no help. They will, you know, a couple of weeks later. And they really specialize on reproduction at that stage. But at this point, they're doing it all their own. Um, and there's some evidence from my lab and a couple other labs that queens, if you take them in the midst of doing all this stuff and then you expose them to insecticides, um, they're actually more sensitive to insecticides at this stage than a worker is. And you might think because they're larger, the queens, larger body, they might be more resistant. No, they're actually, uh, they might be less resistant. They're actually more. And I think it's partly because they're doing all this stuff and they're, um, they're just burning through um, nectar and, and consuming and being exposed to more insecticide. And they're also um, doing all the stuff that's energetically costly. But finally, if they make it, <laughs> they get to the social stage. And at this stage, the queens have all the benefits of sociality. Workers take over all the foraging and brood care. Queens become these egg laying machines. They, they do a little bit of stuff in the nest. They, they continue to do some brood incubation, for example. But in general, the queens really specialize. But it's a trade-off, like, because you, now you have a bunch more bees in the group, you need a lot more food to support all those bees. So thank goodness, food resources tend to increase through the season, but um, if they don't, or if they finish up too soon, if it dries up and all the food's gone, um, then you're not supporting bumblebees at this kind of key point. Um, queen production, I mentioned this already, it's critical. If a colony isn't able to grow and produce um, queens successfully, then it might, you know, it produced some pollination services earlier and and that's wonderful, but that lineage, that that the lineage of that one queen is does not persist. And so they have to produce queens. Um, oh, I meant to take this off. Uh, many nests likely are less likely to fail at this stage. So excuse that um, typo. But um, so we think nest failure is less prevalent at this stage, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen here too. Okay, closing on some opportunities. <laughs> so that was a lot of um, kind of unfortunate stuff. And I, you know, I've 
ended up devoting my career to trying to work on bumblebees and intensively focusing on their conservation. But um, understanding all these stressors, how they act, the details of how they influence bumblebees, I think are really critical because they can lead to strategies for better managing habitat. They can lead to a better argument for regulating the use of certain insecticides, et cetera, et cetera. So that work is really um, important. So um, I want to say when it comes to helping bumblebees, the most important thing we need to do is make major structural systems level changes to try to help them. So we can plant flowers, we should. In fact, that's my next slide. <laughs> but I want to argue that first and foremost, advocating for bumblebees and um, trying to make these major changes is what is what it's really going to take to try to save bumblebees. And I think that point is really important. And I think it gets not glossed over, but it doesn't end up in the lead sometimes. And so I think it should be the lead. Um, so uh, what that, what I mean by that is um, there should be more pesticide regulatory oversight. We've seen neonicotinoids get banned in the UK. We're continuing to use them here in the US. Um, one thing that's happened is in the figure on the bottom right is that some of these pesticides that have been banned in the UK or uh, across the EU, they're now just being exported to us or other parts of the world. And so um, we need to really get our stuff together here and think about the weight of evidence and what we really value and make some changes. And so I think that's possible. I can hope to see it on the horizon. Um, so I just want to say that first and foremost, some of these pesticides that I know no one intends them to hurt bees, but we have abundant evidence. You can't just time when you apply them and avoid the bloom period and have that be enough. They persist. They end up in places where they're not supposed to. Um, so um, that's a big key point. Um, there has to be responsible commercial management and transport. I think the bumblebee commercial industry is really important. I think there are growers that depend on bumblebee pollination services, and it doesn't matter how much they try to support habitat in that area where they want to um, have pollination happen. Um, they need commercial uh, bumblebees in, for pollination. And so I, I respect that. And I think you know these industries also support my research, for example. So we get bumblebees from them so that we can do all these experiments so that we can try to understand how to conserve bumblebees. And so they do have a, they have a role in US agriculture, but I do think that we should sort of do that very responsibly because we also have some examples of how the commercial transport of bumblebees has potentially driven decline. And so the word there for me is responsible or sustainable um, use. I think there needs to be more oversight of where we move honeybees and place them. Um, there's abundant evidence now that under certain conditions, honeybees can spread pathogens um, to native bees, including bumblebees. They also remove a lot of food resources from habitats. And so, um, you know, not surprisingly to me, this is a no brainer. There's no free lunch. You can't just put something somewhere and not expect for it to not take something from the system and add something from the system. And so we just need to be thinking about where we're, how we're sort of strategically placing honeybees to, to minimize some of these effects to, to bumblebees and other native bee species. Um, we need to advocate for more federal and state listing of endangered species. I have a slide coming up that shows some of the species where there's some action happening. Um, here in California, we there was the possibility of some species ending up on our state endangered species list that ended up not happening so far, which is a shame because it came down to a so the wording of the law that doesn't really make biological sense. I'm happy to talk about that a bit more. Um, but once species end up on these state and federal, certainly the federal endangered species list, they can get some really incredible protections um, in place. And so arguing for getting bumblebees on these lists when they are declining um, and deserving, they're all deserving of protection, um, it can be really important. Preservation of wildlands and other habitats, of course, we need to be not only managing our own gardens and yards, but advocating for the, the preservation of other um, places too. And then climate change. This is not a, a lot of these aren't really bumblebee specific things. They actually will positively influence um, a lot of living things. Um, and so are trying to find solutions to climate change and building those into your lives and advocating for broader changes um, is, is one of the things that it, it will take to try to stop bumblebee declines. And, you know, there's some species we've, um, or populations that we've lost, we can't get them back, but I think we can do a lot to change um, trends uh, in bumblebees and other species. Uh, of course, planting more habitat, native plants are great, 
Um, you're going to hear a lot about this, I, th I think, next week from Sam. So I'm not going to talk too much about this. But um, yeah, there are great guides for what to plant. Um, and uh, this is something we can all do, which is awesome. And it's fun and makes your yard look better <laughs> or whatever lands you manage look better. So um, again, Sam's going to talk a lot more about this. So I'll skip over it. Nesting um, habitat is really important too, and overwintering habitat, just leaving some places be so that the bumblebees have some places to carry out some of the other parts of their life cycle is really important. Some positive news. Let's close on some, some really nice, in addition to um, action items, here are some other great things happening. We now have uh, a few couple bumblebees on our federal endangered species list. We have other species here that are at some point in that process, whether it's being evaluated to on their way to being on the list for sure. Um, so this is great. I, you know, you don't want anything on an endangered species list, but once it gets on there, um, it, it rises to a level of um, concern uh, such that many concrete actions are taken to better conserve it. So this is to me, this is good news because the decline is happening. Now it's sort of formally being recognized. Denise mentioned this. I'm leading an effort to build a national native bee monitoring strategy. I can just tell you this um, project has been really um, inspiring because we have folks from all kinds of different branches and units in the federal government, state governments, more than 100 academics. We have workshops and we'll have we have more than 500 people who have attended one or more of these workshops. And so um, there's a lot of movement that you might not always hear about it. Although some of these um, groups, they have had some sort of formal announcements and things that have been made public. But I'll just say a little bit behind the scenes too, there is a ton of action. People that are really inspired about monitoring native bees, the idea that monitoring is a cornerstone of conservation. So we have a new website that's going to be coming out soon sometime late spring or early summer. So um, I'll ask Denise if she doesn't mind to share that uh, website with you as well. We have an old website, but this is a, a new one that's gonna have more resources for folks. Um, there are community science projects. Many of you may already be involved in these. Um, they're so important. So, um, you know, here's an example of from the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas. This is a project from Xerces and some collaborators where Bombus fraternus, this is a bee that um, there are all these new county records now. This is one of many examples of how these atlas projects or, you know, monitoring projects in general, members of the public, you know, community scientists are, are finding these new records in new places, or they're helping collect enough information that we know that we probably can't find something somewhere. So both of those things are so important. Here in California, there's a new project that's just launched. I saw a few of you, I saw one Redondo Beach person. So there, you know, we have this California Bumblebee Atlas project that just launched this year and is going to be running for a few years. So um, I can share the link for that as well. Lots of projects to get involved in. These truly do benefit. I mean, when, when we know now that a bee is found in a county that we didn't know it existed in, that information can ultimately lead to conservation action for that bee in that place. And so it's it's so important. It's just such a great example of how everyone can, can pitch in and help us understand um, bee distributions and decline. I'll just say, these are two folks from my lab. This is Blanca Guillen on the left and Claude Genea Costa. Blanca is a first year PhD student and Claude Genea is a postdoc in the lab. We have a whole new generation of amazing bumblebee biologists who are, you know, their careers are being forged in the era of, recognizing and trying to stop bumblebee decline. And so we have, there are so many researchers now that are really focused on trying to understand and stop the decline. So I, they definitely give me hope that we have some, we have some, uh, there's some optimism, there's some reason for it. Uh, so the more we mobilize as a research community, the more people get involved and do the, the research that we need, the better. So I'm, I'm just, they definitely make me feel like things, there's some cause for optimism. And then I'll just say, and I'm going to close on this note uh, with this classic quote <laughs> from Jurassic Park, that we have lost some bumblebees from some places. That's just a fact. Um, but uh, if we make changes, I, I actually have a lot of hope that we can conserve them in, in certain places and that we can bolster their population. So I actually do think things are more resilient sometimes than we maybe even give them credit. I mentioned how mystified I am that some bumblebees seem to be doing fine these days in spite of everything that we've done. So life really will find a way sometimes, but you have to create the conditions in order for it to do that. So um, hopefully I've given some helpful um, in information or background and then some, some things that you can do to try to help uh, make this change happen. So with that, 
I will say thank you. I think it's awesome that you're all here and learning about bumblebees. And thank you, Denise. I think you're great. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, Hollis. Thank you so much. We have so many great questions. Thanks, everybody, for putting those into the Q&A box. We won't have time to get to all of them, but we'll um, we'll take some of those top questions. And and so, Hollis, you mentioned the, oh, the your old website, which we put a link into the chat box, and it's also on our Bumblebee uh, short course webpage. When folks visit your old website, once the new one is up, will it take them there? Will they give them a link or... Hmm. So think about that, right? It would be great yeah. if they could get a, we a can, connection. I, yeah, I've learned through this process how, how much I'm not a web developer. But yes, we can we can direct the traffic to the new site. Awesome, awesome. super. So the question that had the most uh, upvotes was about creating artificial bumblebee nests. And I wonder if you had uh, some, some thoughts on that. Helpful, not helpful? Um, I, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> Uh, but I will say I showed the, the photo of the RFID system and the queen free foraging. Um, the student, soon to be PhD, Erica, who did that work, she had to go all the way to the Rocky Mountains because we knew that people there, there's one or two published studies where people have been able to put out boxes and queens would consistently come to them. And so she had to go all the way to, Cal uh, to Colorado to put out boxes to try to get these queens. And we ended up getting data from three queens and so she's going to go back this summer many researchers have been trying to put out bumblebee boxes and get lots of nesting success and i can tell you from those efforts that occupancy is really low um that doesn't mean that if if everybody put out a couple of bumblebee boxes in their yard then if you scale that up then that's actually pretty great um but you might not see bumblebees nesting in your boxes if you do that because it just doesn't happen that often so um i think that's a Really unfortunate, it limits our research because it limits our ability to work with these young nests. And then obviously the bigger thing is that it limits our ability to create kind of like the ultimate nesting habitat for bumblebees, which would be a, a little cavity kind of set up for them. Great, so I put in a link. We do have the, the SARE Guide to Managing Alternative Pollinators on our webpage, and it has some instructions for, for creating those artificial nests. But as Hollis said, it's not, you know, not that reliable, not that um, dependable, but um, worth a try anyway. So thank you. Yeah. So there are several questions about um, pollen and nectar and kind of how the bumblebees um, use that nectar. How do they take it back? How do they, how do the larvae ingest that? What, what's that kind of process about? Um, the main way that flows is that bees are out visiting flowers. They um, sort of uh, they consume the nectar, they hold it in a special structure in the, that's part of the digestive tract. Um, but rather than digesting most of it, they bring it back to the nest for the bumblebees. They have these little really cute, um, honey pots and they go to them and they regurgitate the nectar. They'll do a little bit of, um, activity that helps concentrate the nectar. Um, and then it's stored there for them and it can store keep long-term. And uh, when then when they're in the nest, the individuals within the nest can go to the pot, get a little bit of the nectar. Usually if they're feeding larvae, the, the food for the larvae is a, well, it is a mixture of pollen and nectar. And so they'll, uh, we don't know the details of how they do it, but they'll have a little bit of both, mix it up, and then they deliver it back to the larvae. And what they do is the larvae are in a wax envelope. This is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> they'll open the wax envelope with their mouth parts and they'll stick their little mouth parts in. And you can actually see them in the video I wanted to show, it shows this, they get really still. And then you can see their little abdomens kind of squish up and that's them regurgitating the food to the larvae. And so if you sit and watch a bumblebee nest um, for long enough, really not that long, if it's a bigger nest, you'll see workers kind of running around or or the queen if it's early in the nesting cycle there it's almost they're using the intent they're antenating the the larvae they're kind of they're, they're um inspecting is what we call it and then if they receive a signal that a larva is hungry and there is a chemical um hunger signal they'll then do this regurgitation awesome and so let's see so there were other questions related to foraging then how far will workers tend to go from the the colony and how far will the queen go and this came up uh, in a few other webinars and we we didn't uh, we didn't address it but there's a lot of curiosity about that yeah i have a review paper maybe i can try to 
find it in like it's molecular tools and bumblebees and we have a section in it where we looked at the molecular data that helps try to answer that question the common convention and i think this is correct is that maybe a couple kilometers three kilometers at most for the workers but i think in some species maybe especially if they're larger bodied and especially if they have to go that far i think they could probably go farther for the queens um we don't know, <laughs> you know, there's some for the, for foraging, um, they're larger bodied. And so the, the general convention in bees is that the larger you are, the more you might be able to travel to forage. Um, but at the same time, as I showed you the queen, she can't be gone for too long because um, the, the, the brood, the babies back home need to be cared for. So there, we might think that she should take shorter foraging flights. So um, few, I'd say a few kilometers. I know this isn't the most satisfying answer. And then in terms of dispersal, which is a different thing, um, there's some evidence that bumblebee queens can can actually move on the order of on um, tens of kilometers. And I, there's one study that found that they can maybe even go 100 or more kilometers, but I am not sure. Uh, I find that curious. So I think we're, the jury's still out on that. So when you say dispersal, is that for the gynes in the fall and then their movement to, to their hibernacula? Yeah, interestingly, we don't know if they move more in the fall or in the spring or both, but yeah, referring to the young queens before they start their nest. Awesome, so we really need some engineers who can invent some very, very small tracking devices that can stay long-term on these queens. There are just so many questions um, about them out there. Yeah, the dream is that you could use telemetry and it could not influence the bees flight and they, they would just behave totally as normal and you know I could fly around in a helicopter or something <laughs> with a receiver and, and track exactly where she's going but we're not quite there yet in terms of the tech but I think we're on the way so I bet in the next decade or something we'll have that that technology can't wait Awesome. So this question comes up fairly often. Fran asks about what pollen and nectar from human poisonous plants or maybe also other mammals, horses and dogs that are, the plants are poisonous to them or to us. And does this bother bees? Hmm. Um, the, some of the great toxicity, kind of naturally occurring compound toxicity studies that I know of um, are not about things that to the best of my knowledge um, other like vertebrates regularly encounter. So I mentioned the linden trees and then there's some evidence that these linden trees actually produce some compounds that are harmful for bees. Um, there's also evidence that they, well, this is getting, well, there, there's also some evidence that they lure bumblebees in and then they, they don't produce enough pollen and nectar. So that story is still a little complicated, but bumblebees do forage on some things like foxglove. They love it. They're all these, you know, I'm sure you've seen the little bumblebee butts sticking out of the foxglove flowers. Um, certainly if humans were to consume enough digitalis purpurea, that would not, not be good. It has effects on our nervous system and, um, uh, and, and sort of cardiac rhythmicity, but um, bumblebees can consume that pollen and they seem to be okay. But I, that's a huge slice of bumblebee biology that I think is really exciting and that we really don't know enough about. And there's that, I think it's Paracelsus, the, the old quote of everything is just a matter of dose, you know? So some of these compounds are probably maybe beneficial at low doses, but are certainly harmful if they ingested enough. So it's, I hate to be the scientist who just says like, it's complicated and it depends, but I think that's actually the case. Okay, so there were several questions around ground bees in general. And I wonder if you can just kind of break that down to help folks understand what is a ground bee? Are bumblebees ground bees? Uh, just this common vernacular and how does it relate to bumblebees? Hmm. I think when people use that phrase, they're referring more to solitary bees that nest in the ground, but bumblebees, not all bumblebees, but most bumblebees nest in the ground too. So technically they are a ground bee as well, but most bees, if you look across all the species, most of them are solitary and most of them do nest in the ground. And so um, that name is, is uh, that kind of common phrase isn't really, doesn't help you narrow it down because a lot of them actually have that kind of lifestyle. So yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't refer, my, personally, I wouldn't refer to bumblebees as ground bees, but like I said, they usually do nest in the ground. So 
Okay, great. That's helpful. So um, a question that was posted to kind of a beginner level, if you could just kind of reiterate the easy way to tell a carpenter bee from a bumblebee, because in spring in many areas, they're out now and they're both around the same size. And what's a what's an easy way to tell them apart? I mean, the way I do it, um, if, especially if they're flying around and they're a little hard to see, because we have a bunch of the big carpenter bees out here in California, too is the carpenter bees have this giant shiny black abdomen. Bumblebees, the only little asterisk comment is that some of the queens, if they've been around for a while um, and they've lost a lot of hair on the abdomen, you might see them. And sometimes for a second, you'll think, oh, it's a carpenter bee. And then you look a little closer and you're like, oh my gosh, it's just a very threadbare bumblebee. But that's that's the main way I tell. Um, and then um, the carpenter bees are a lot more zippy. Um, you know, They fly around a lot more quickly and the, whereas the bumblebees tend to be more whatever the opposite of zippy is, bumbly. Right, right, great. Um, so you talked a lot about different um, types of weather variation and their effects on, um, on bumblebees. Um, so there were a couple questions about wind and noticing you know, heavier winds. In fact, we have a really windy day here uh, around me. Any effects on um, bumblebees with increased winds? Yeah, there's some really cool work that's been done on bumblebees and their ability to fly in, under turbulent conditions and some of the dynamics of that. That's less my area, but um, in general, it requires more energy to stabilize yourself um, in turbulent wind versus a no wind at all. And so um, you'll see, and I'm, I'm guessing part of the reason for asking this question was inspired by this, on a really windy day or during a really windy period, you'll be like, hey, where'd the bumblebees go? <laughs> Whereas they were all over the place. And they there seems to be some avoidance. They'll either hang out on a flower or maybe they won't leave the nest in the first place if it's too windy. So um, yeah, there's this, there's a lot of cool work on how the sort of the biomechanics of how they orient and wind and it's, it's harder to do. <laughs> okay, a couple of people mentioned the uh, rusty patch bumblebee and the shift westward. And if you can make any comments on that. Um, I think part of it is that some of the more Eastern parts of its range it's gotten really hot. So some of the places where you used to see it dipping down into the Southeast, there are still some rusty patch bumblebees um, in West Virginia, for example, but I think it's this pattern that we see sometimes that in the, in places where it's gotten a lot hotter, they just can't hang on. So I think that's part of it. Um, and if I had to guess, I would say that's probably the main thing. So, um, yeah, I think they're persisting where they can. And, uh, but I think there's some unexplained stuff too. Like, well, we still don't really understand completely why they decline so rapidly in the first place. And so I think if we knew a little bit more about that, maybe we could kind of, as a corollary to that, we could have a better sense of why they've been lost more from the Eastern part and Southern part of their range. Right. So, uh, so let's wrap up with Paul's question about um, social networks for people that uh, where they can go to learn more about bumblebees. Do you have any thoughts or maybe folks, if you're on a social network, a Facebook group or other that you'd like to put into the chat box to share um, where you go to learn more about bumblebees, but Hollis, I'm sure you have some thoughts too. Yeah, I, one thing I'd say is there's some great wisdom in some of the older books. So Sladen's The Humble Bee is awesome. I go back to it all the time. Um, Alfred, another um, a, a British bumblebee researcher, has written some books on bumblebees and has a lot of great info about queens in there. Um, Dave Goulson wrote an awesome book about bumblebees. Um, we, I would say as a bee group, we're actually doing pretty well in terms of having some really nice literature <laughs> out there that you can peruse. I mentioned Bern Heinrich, his book, Bumblebee Economics, I probably have a copy within like reaching distance <laughs> in my office. His book, Bumblebee Economics is really, really great. Um, and yeah, if, uh, I have some links to some of our work on, on our lab website. I'm happy to share any of that. If anyone ever, you know, if you can't access a paper, um, ideally everyone would be able to access everything, but there's some really great peer reviewed studies that um, hopefully are available open access or you can always email me. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of good stuff out there. And then I, I think the Xerces Society is one of the like gold standard um, organizations that's focused on, they're focused pretty heavily on bumblebee um, conservation, although they help a lot of other insect groups too, but their bumblebee group is really strong. So I think they're kind of a 
they're kind of my go-to um, resource for, for um, outreach materials or kind of information about habitat management or anything like that. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'll add, uh, uh, Halshi mentioned a few books that aren't on our webpage and uh, folks, I'll put those in there uh, under our book link and um, add some of those other links as well. Hollis, I'll follow up with you to get some of the papers that you shared and list those links up there as well. Um, and lots of you have been putting in thank yous to Hollis in the chat box. Thank you so much. I know she appreciates that. What a great presentation today, Hollis. Really appreciate all of your knowledge and uh, you know so many different directions you took us, also giving us some, um, some hope for the future and um, particularly someone who dives deep into these topics. It's, uh, it's nice to have some optimism to see that uh, is out there in the field. Thank you. Denise. So again, thanks everybody. We'll, um, we'll see you next week for our last session and uh, Hollis, thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Bye.